So we have been in a series since the beginning of the year on Seek My Face. That is our theme throughout the year. We will continually go back to Seek My Face. And a synonym for the word face is presence. The Lord wants us to seek his presence with all of our heart. And we cannot seek his presence, we cannot seek his face without the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the very presence of Jesus, amen? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. And so today, I want to teach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to move quickly. We have a lot of scripture we're going to dig into. Are you hungry today? Yes. Say, I will, I will not be distracted, not be distracted. By, the clock. by the clock. I will not be distracted. By hunger pains. pains. In Jesus' name. name. Alright, we have a couple of handsome gentlemen that are going to be passing out uh, a scripture sheet. These are kind of a condensed version of my notes. So you can use these to follow along. I will say these are from last week. Uh, We were planning to teach this sermon last Sunday and uh, the Holy Spirit moved in the house. We did not get to it. So... There are a couple of changes, and I'll let you know when we get there. You can, if you have a pen, you can write in some additional scripture passages. So, I want to teach this morning on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. As we continue in our series, Seek My Face. And I know for this topic, there can be a lot of baggage that comes with the baptism in the Holy Spirit, some misunderstanding, some offense. Um, And I hope today that the Lord can, can clarify His Word. Because the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a promise for every believer. Amen? 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 The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a promise for every believer. It is not an add on to the Christian life. It is what Jesus paid for on the cross. Amen? Yeah. All right. I need your help today. So, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at nine years old. At Northwest Assemblies of God in Dublin, Ohio, my uncle was the children's pastor there. And he taught that day. We happened to be visiting uh, family in Dublin, and we went to church, and he taught on the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and at the end, there was an invitation uh, for, for all of the kids in the room to seek the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and he prayed over me, and I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at nine years old. I had been baptized in water just months before that. I spoke in tongues for the very first time, and it was a day that marked my life. How many of you can testify you have a similar story you can remember the day that you were baptized in the Holy Spirit? It marks you. It marks you. It changes. It transforms. And so I want to look um, at Scripture today. I want to help bring clarity. If you have questions, if you don't really understand the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I'm praying that the Lord gives me the words and the wisdom to help bring understanding to our hearts. Because without the Holy Spirit, the church is dead. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot accomplish what we have been created for and mandated to accomplish. He is everything. Amen? So let's go Matthew chapter 3. This is John the Baptist Before Jesus even enters onto the scene, John the Baptist says these words to those who were gathered around listening to him teach. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Who's he talking about? Jesus. Jesus. Whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So then we move forward into the Gospels, John chapter 7. This is now Jesus prophesying about 
the Holy Spirit who was to come. Jesus said this, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he had said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus is prophesying about something that is yet to come, the Holy Spirit. And he said, out of your innermost being, out of your belly, out of your heart, what you receive will flow out of you rivers of living water. He's prophesying about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts, following his resurrection, he appeared to his disciples. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. And while staying with them, Jesus, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus is echoing the words of his cousin John, that you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this was fulfilled Ten days later, as 120 of those who were present in that crowd waited in Jerusalem, and in Acts chapter 2, we read it being fulfilled. They were gathered together, 120. This fulfilled Joel's prophecy almost 800 years before it happened. Joel prophesied, in the last days, Jesus, the Father says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 800 years before this was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. Can you imagine waiting 800 years for a word to be fulfilled? How many of you would lose interest? You would lose heart? You would lose belief? 800 years it was fulfilled. This is what Jesus paid for. I love Melissa Helster. She says, the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the crescendo of the cross. We so often stop at the cross. We get saved, right? We are forgiven, and we see salvation more as a ticket to heaven rather than a mandate to bring heaven to earth. And we just sit and we wait for the rapture or we wait to die so that we can go to heaven. And how many of you know there is far more to the Christian life than just sitting around waiting for Jesus to return? Amen? We cannot stop at the cross. The cross is the starting point in the Christian life, not the end. We start at the cross, and there's far more, far more that Jesus paid for, that we often, we talk ourselves or convince ourselves out of because we, we don't have an understanding or We've seen different things abused or we were not exactly sure how to logically process what we are seeing and what we're experiencing. And so something that is unfamiliar, we stay away from it because we don't fully understand it. And how many of you know if we wait until we fully understand everything, we will do nothing, right? We're not called to understand, we're called to walk by faith, even when we don't understand. And so, I pray this earlier today. Holy Spirit, offend our minds to reveal our hearts. That's my prayer for this message. That anything in my mind that is not in agreement and in alignment with this word, Holy Spirit would deal with us today and deal with me. So let's talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You excited? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Amen. All right, well, first, who is the Holy Spirit? So I'm just going to go down through a quick list. I think you have it on these sheets. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God. Just as much as the Father and the Son. They're not in competition with each other, right? Right? They are one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Godhead, the triune Godhead. He is a member of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is not an it. He is not a force. He is not a power. He is a person. He has an intellect, feelings, will, and actions. He is the Spirit of Jesus. He bears the attributes of God. He is eternal. He is all-knowing. He is present everywhere. He is all-powerful. He does the works of God. In creation, we see it right from the beginning. In the beginning, the, the Spirit of the Lord was hovering. We sang it today. As the Spirit was moving over the waters, He was present at creation. He is uh, active in regeneration, that is salvation. He gives us the Holy Scriptures. He resurrects the dead, right? The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. He is symbolized by wind, water, a seal, not like bouncing a ball on their nose, a seal, but like, okay, not the animal, the seal, but a seal that you seal a, a, a letter with that cannot be opened unless broken. Right, it it, um, it seals it, it uh, completes it, and it does. Okay, let's stop thinking about seals because that's all I can think about right now is a seal bouncing this ball on his nose. The Holy Spirit empowers the believer. He is our comforter, our counselor, our baptizer, giver of gifts. He leads us into all truth. He convicts the unbeliever of sin and the believer of righteousness. Let's boil all of this down together. Okay, here's the scripture that you need to write down or turn to. John 14, verses 16 through 17. This is not on your sheet because I added it this week. John 14, 16 through 17. Who is the Holy Spirit? Let's boil everything down to that long description that we just read. Who is the Holy Spirit? Jesus said this. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. The word that Jesus used there for another, there's two ways, two words that could have been used for another. All right, this morning, Wes, he sat on this seat here. Anybody know the technical term for what this is? It's a drummer's throne. How cool is that? King Wesley sat on a drummer's throne this morning. So, this is a seat. I can say, Bradley, could you give me another seat? Give me another seat. Good. All right. Thank you, Pastor Brad. What a, I'll give it back to you just a minute so you have a seat. So, I just asked Bradley for another seat, but anyone who can see this morning can see that these are both seats, but they're very different. This is not the same as that. It is another, but it is another of a different kind. When Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, Jesus used the word another, that meant another of the exact same kind. Perfectly mirrored. And so, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is Jesus. He is the Spirit of Jesus. Nothing can be found in the character of the Holy Spirit that cannot be found in the person of Jesus. They are the same. They are one. So when you think about the Holy Spirit, you think about Jesus. And if something in your mental process is in conflict when you think about the, with, uh, the Holy Spirit in Jesus, th there's an issue there that needs to be worked out. Because the Holy Spirit is the same as Jesus. He is another of the same kind. The Greek word there is alos. A-L-L-O-S. Another of the same kind. The Holy Spirit is not a force to know about, but a person to be experienced. Amen. Oh, he's not a force, guys. Okay? You don't have to be Luke Skywalker. He's not a force. He is a person like Jesus. 
to be experienced by every believer, to be indwelled and to be clothed in. Amen? Whew. Okay. So let's talk about baptism. The word baptism means to be fully immersed. Do you know what the earliest, um, the earliest uses of the word baptism were found in um, the word describing a piece of fabric or a piece of clothing being immersed into a dye, a color solution to be transformed into a different color. That piece of fabric was baptized into that dye. It's also used to baptize a pickle into vinegar. Or, sorry, a cucumber into vinegar that becomes a pickle, right? So those were some of the earliest uses of the word baptism. So we have officially now changed our language in LifeWay. Instead of baptism in the Holy Spirit, we're going to say you get to be pickled in the Holy Spirit. Okay? We're going with that. I think that would be great. Have you been pickled in the Holy Spirit lately? Come on. Yes? With a seal. That's right. So, um, there are, I don't want to go quick here, there are three different baptisms that we see in Scripture. One, two, three. What's one of them? Water baptism. What's another? Baptism in the Holy Spirit. What's the third? Okay, that's the same. Baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire. You do have it on your sheet. That was a good guess, though. The first baptism that we see is baptism into the body of Christ. This is baptism into Jesus. This is conversion. This is salvation. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Who is doing the baptizing here? Who's doing the baptizing? Who's the agent of baptism? The Holy Spirit. For by one spirit, we were baptized into the body of Christ. So the Holy Spirit is the one who baptizes us, who immerses us into the body of Christ, into salvation. He gives us new birth. The Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. He indwells us and is the one who baptizes us. So the Holy Spirit is there at the moment of salvation. He comes into us. It resides within us. We become holy. We become the righteousness of God. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. The second baptism is water baptism. We're going to be having a water baptism service soon. This is where we identify with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. Proclaiming to the world, you are, I am a new creation in Christ and have dedicated your, my life to him. I identify with Jesus in his death and resurrection, and I am now a new creation in him, and I get to testify that to the world. So in water baptism, who is the agent of baptism? Who's the agent? Who's doing the baptizing? Come on, people. Who's doing it? Please do not say the pastor. It's disciples. Jesus said, go into all the world. And what? Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is disciples dis baptizing disciples. That is why for us, water baptism, it's, it's, we, we, uh, it's very participatory. It's we want the church involved. If you led someone to Christ, I heard this I can't remember what church it was. If you lead somebody to Jesus, you are the one to baptize them. Because you are the one that led them to Christ. It cannot just be the role of the pastors. It is disciples baptizing disciples. That was the commission Jesus gave. All right, and the third baptism, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Your life is fully immersed into the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. As John said, Jesus, who's the agent in spirit baptism? Jesus. Jesus. 
John said that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit following his water baptism as the Spirit came upon him like a dove. Jesus needed to be immersed into the Holy Spirit. Jesus was baptized in water by his cousin John. When Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens opened. Everybody witnessed it. Everybody heard the Father speak. Everybody saw the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus. Not just descend on him, but John said, the one whom the Holy, who the Holy Spirit descends on and remains. So the Holy Spirit not only descended on Jesus, the Holy Spirit remained on Jesus throughout the next three and a half years. Do you know, I learned this, that this verse is in all four Gospels. Do you know how many things made it into all four Gospels? Very few. Very few things made it into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But this verse that John says, one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, is in all four Gospels. Because it's important. And Jesus needed to be full of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's power to minister. So why do we need the baptism in the Holy Spirit? You all with me? I know I'm moving fast. There's a reason. So let me clarify this. You, you may be asking or thinking or may have wondered, um, do, do I not have the Holy Spirit when I ask Jesus into my life to be my Lord and be my Savior? Don't I have the Holy Spirit then? And the answer is yes, absolutely you do. When that moment, when you put your complete faith and trust and you give your entire life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit comes and does a work of justification and begins a work of sanctification in your life. You become holy. You become the righteousness of God. You cannot be holy without the Holy Spirit. Amen? The Holy Spirit lives in you. He takes up residence within you. Just like in John chapter 20, after, or right before women. Make sure I'm getting this right. Okay. So Jesus, he died. He rose again. He walks on the earth for a few more weeks, and during that time, he is with his disciples, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He breathes on them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. That was their salvation moment. That was their regeneration moment. That is when they were baptized into the body of Jesus was in this moment. But these were the same disciples who were then in the upper room who received the baptism in the Holy Spirit just days later. But the Holy Spirit had been deposited in them to begin that work. Amen? Does that make sense? No one can say, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. We preached a few weeks ago that we are the dwelling place of the Lord. We are the dwelling place of His Holy Spirit. And nobody can say, Jesus is my Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. He is in you at that moment. But Jesus, His desire is to get what is in you out of you. Amen? Here's where the breakdown begins to happen. We are going to teach on the, on the Holy Spirit all throughout the month of February. And one of the things that we're going to teach on is the breath of God. In, I'm sorry, what did I say? In February, Pathway of Jesus. Yes, the first four weeks will be on the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the breath of God. And it's like... When we are breathing, we breathe him in. But how many of you know you cannot survive if all you do is inhale? You won't last very long if you do not exhale. And so often we, we hunger and we want more of the Holy Spirit, more of the Holy Spirit. We're inhaling. We're taking in more and more and more. But if we do not exhale, 
If we do not give away the Holy Spirit, we begin to lose the work that he's done in us. It begins to fade because we keep thinking we just need more and more and more. And the Lord is like, no, I want him to get out, 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 out. It's why I deposited him in you. It's why you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. We're going to teach more about that throughout the month of February. But the Lord, his desire is to get what is in us, out of us, into the world. It's why we exist as the church. It's why we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's why Jesus said it is better for you that I go. Because if I go, the Holy Spirit will come. And the church can now accomplish, instead of just one man on whom the Holy Spirit descended and remained, now I have an army that the Holy Spirit has now come and empowered to do the very work that Jesus came to do. We are finishing his work, amen? Amen. amen. Okay, so, in order for something to flow out of you, it first has to be in us. That's what we just read that scripture, that out of your heart, out of your belly, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Well, if something is flowing out of you, it first has to be in you in order to flow out. The Holy Spirit is in us at salvation. But there is a second work of grace, as some call it. It's like you taking a glass of water and drinking the water. The water is not within you. But when you are baptized into the Holy Spirit, it is like you are thrust into an ocean. You are clothed with Him. You are endued with power. This is what we're talking about today. This is what some of us in this room, we need to step into. Some for the very first time today. So, Acts 6, I'm sorry, Acts 1, starting in verse 6. Why do we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Okay, Jesus was with him three and a half years, did all of his teaching, all of his miracles. He was murdered, buried in the tomb. He rose from the dead and he's resurrected. He's with them now. And the disciples still do not get it. They are still thinking Jesus is going to ride in with this army of angels. They're going to overthrow Rome. He's going to establish this political government and take over everything. They still do not understand why he came. And Jesus is like, you boneheads. No, he didn't say that. But he did say... In so many words, stop worrying about things you don't need to be concerned about. He says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What is... The primary purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'll give you a hint. You just read it. To be witnesses. How? How long? What do we need to be witnesses? Power. Exactly. To be. So true witnesses. Um. Doesn't just mean you know about somebody, but you know that person. And in order to know that, you need to have the Holy Spirit actively working in your life. You need the power of heaven to demonstrate the kingdom. That's why we're here. We're not just here to tell other people about Jesus. We are here to demonstrate heaven's power on the earth. And Jesus said, listen, you've been with me for three and a half years. You've seen it all. You've heard it all. But you still need something. You're not ready just yet. You need to be clothed with power from on high in order to demonstrate heaven. In order to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons. Amen? And so Jesus says, don't go just yet. I'm sure they were all antsy and ready to go, ready to get another to Jesus. But he said, don't go just yet. Way in Jerusalem. 
until you have been clothed with power from on high. And I'm sure they're all thinking, what in the world do you even mean, Jesus? Like, how could we not be more ready than we are now? Walking and operating in heaven's power is the primary purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Power over sin in your life. We were listening to a message in the pastor. He sent out an email to his staff and he said, tell me about the moment when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And half of the testimonies from his staff came back that when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were set free from pornography. Because the baptism in the Holy Spirit empowers you. It gives you power over sin in your life that you've been struggling with. To overcome and to walk in freedom. Power to perform miracle signs and wonders. And power to witness. Do you struggle witnessing? Do you struggle talking about Jesus? Have you been baptized in the spirit of fire? Because you take Peter who was living in shame. And in a few days from denying Jesus, he's baptized in the Holy Spirit and he stands up in a public arena and he starts preaching the gospel when the disciples were being hunted for being followers of Jesus. A few days ago, he's denying Jesus because of that fact. And now he's been baptized in the Spirit and he stands up in a public square and he starts preaching the gospel. Unafraid, uninhibited. Why? Because he had received the fullness of the Holy Spirit to be able to Witness, power to witness, power to overcome sin, power to demonstrate the kingdom of heaven on earth. And there's also gifts and fruit. Those who are baptized in the spirit become a little fruity. We know that. How many of you are proud to be fruity? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, here's a quote from George Wood. He was the former superintendent of the Assemblies of God. It's on your, on your sheet. It says this, The church cannot function without the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our personal life cannot function without the Holy Spirit. We might study our Bible on a regular basis, but unless we have the operating presence of the Spirit in our lives, we are not doing anything that really counts in the kingdom of God. Wow. Unless we do not have the operating presence of the Spirit of God in our life, we are not doing anything that really counts in the kingdom. The baptism in the Holy Spirit draws us deeper into intimacy with the Lord and compels us to go into the world and make disciples. I love what Bill Johnson says, the Holy Spirit is in me for my sake, he's on me for yours. We have been clothed in him to go out and witness and demonstrate heaven to our world for others. There's an invitation to every believer right now in this place this morning. Okay, focus. This is too important to miss because we're distracted and we're ready to go. There's an invitation to every believer in Jesus to live, move, and have our being in the presence of the Holy Spirit and operating in our lives. All people. Joel said, all people, he will pour out his spirit on. It's available to every person. It is part of the person of the Christian life. It is not an add-on. It is not optional. It's not a la carte. It is the promise of the Father for every believer. It is why Jesus went through the cross. And here's how we wrap it up. The most mind, if you would think, what is the most mind blowing thing Jesus ever said to his disciples? I doubt many of us would think of this passage of scripture. Here's the last one you need to write down John 16, 4 through 7. And I'm going to have some help on communicating this point to you, but we're going to read this scripture and then I'm going to have Bill Johnson take it from there. John 16, 4 through 7. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Jesus is telling the disciples he is ready to leave. That in a few short weeks he will no longer be with him. This was right before he was betrayed by Judas and went to the cross. Nevertheless, verse 7. Okay, the most mind-blowing thing Jesus ever said or did. 
to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Those words were the most profound, mind-blowing, frustrating things probably the disciples ever heard Jesus say. Because none of them wanted Jesus to leave. So I want you to listen to this clip. This is uh, Bill Johnson, pastor of Bethel Church in Reading, and he expounds on this a little. Refreshed 
to be endowed with power, would you come forward and step forward into the altar right now? We're, we're doing business, church. We're not playing around. Come on. Thank you. Praise God. This is his promise to us. You need a refreshing of the Holy Spirit. You're filled, but he wants to pour out through you. And whatever has been hindering you, he is going to break through. Now I'm going to ask you again. If you have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you feel frustrated, confused, or you've just never asked. Because what I shared with you a couple weeks ago is that it's a yielding and a taking hold of. It's a yielding to the Holy Spirit, but also a taking hold of and asking Him to come. And then yielding to His flow. He is not abusive. Amen? He is gentle. Whew. So if you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit and had that moment with your Savior where Jesus comes and fills you with His Spirit, with power, please come forward now and step into this moment. It is not a mark of shame. It is not a mark of something wrong with you at all. I rebuke those thoughts in the name of Jesus. But He wants to fill you to overflowing. Amen? Come rest on us, to find your 